Okay, thanks, Prof. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to have uh, uh, the nice academic, last academic discussion of the week. Um, but uh, still, I think this is a very interesting topic. We will see preeclampsia daily in our obstetric wards. <clears throat> uh, but I really enjoyed reading on it, and um, especially since working, started working in special care, it was nice to go read more, and it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's quite interesting, and I hope that some of you will, will find it interesting as, as well. Uh, just uh, the content of the talk, uh, it's, it's a very simple talk, actually. Uh, I'm just going to give some background information first that we, before we head into the main part um, of the discussion. Then we're going to look at the uh, pathophysiology of, of preeclampsia and then how we can treat treatment that we use and also ones that we are looking at or can, can look at in the, in the future. And then after that, we are done. The first thing I had to um, look at uh, when preparing this talk was at this definition because I did not know it. Um, putative pathophysiology, which generally considered to be, this is basically what we're going to talk about. We assume what the pathophysiology is. We're not exactly sure why it happens, um, but there's lots of mechanisms involved. I'm going to start off with the diagnostic criteria uh, as released this year by the International Society of, for the Study of Hypertension and Pregnancy in 2018. This is, uh, I took this straight from that. Uh, and it's, it, it, it's important to note that hypertension, gestational hypertension, is the one thing that we do need. Um, and then followed by any of these conditions, new onset after 20 weeks. Uh, proteinuria is obviously the one that we uh, generally consider uh, still that we need to make the diagnosis. But in most women who have preeclampsia, they will have pre protein, significant proteinuria. Then the other things that we look at are um, affectation of maternal organ systems, uh, of which you can just the kidneys, liver involvement, neurological complications, and also hematological complications. <clears throat> and then also lastly, uh, uteroplacental dysfunction evident by fetal growth restriction uh, or high um, Doppler resistance. So this is, the, this is the diagnostic criteria released and we mostly follow that. We just have to look at some uh, possible etiologies of preeclampsia. Uh, if we look at some genetic Factors, women whose mothers had preeclampsia have a 20 to 25% risk of, of developing preeclampsia. And if, um, if they have a sister, that risks up to 35 to 40%. Uh, then one of our big problems in our community is uh, obesity. And then also we do see more mothers that are, are age over 40, which increases their risk. The obstetric, obstetric factors involved, uh, primiparity, multiple pregnancies, and then eye drops for, for whatever reason uh, underlying um, um, aneuploidy. And then also uh, previous preeclampsia history, which we will, which we will see there is uh, eclampsia. Um, <clears throat> just a mistake. Medical diseases we have to look at. Hypertension, renal disease, and diabetes are the ones that we see the most in our setting. Uh, but then also we have to think of other things like um, antiphospholipid syndrome and sickle cell disease. And then there's an immunological factor involved as well. Uh, if we talk about premium paternity, basically it means that if you have a father, a new father in a relationship or the first child, that increases your chance of getting preeclampsia. And also a sexual relationship that's less than six months since you started the relationship to having, to, to having a, your first baby. Just some interesting uh, chances or numbers. Uh, the different sources all talk about slightly different numbers, but this is what I, what I uh, came up with uh, in most of them. Uh, that if you have preeclampsia, your risk of developing, developing it again in this current pre pregnancy is about one in six. Um, but the disease is usually milder and it, de it develops a bit later in the, than in the previous pregnancy. But if you had a severe uh, complications which um, led to a delivery less than three or four weeks, that risk goes up to one in four. Um, and if you had complications that led to delivery before 28 weeks, that risk goes up uh, to one in two. So it's, it's just important to, I think, to, to know that uh, type of numbers. And then in the current pregnancy, 
transient, uh, transient gestational hypertension, it's something that we see quite a lot. It's when someone develops, has a high blood pressure reading, but if you take it late in the day or a couple of days later, that blood pressure is normal, they still have a 40% chance of uh, developing gestational hypertension in that pregnancy with a 20% chance of developing preeclampsia. If you have gestational hypertension, you have a 25% risk chance of, of, of developing preeclampsia in the current pregnancy. The, higher, the earlier you develop the gestational hypertension, the higher your risk becomes. And then if you have chronic hypertension, you've got a 25% chance of superimposed preeclampsia. Another thing that the ISSHP um, talk about in the new guidelines is that we should consider preeclampsia as a severe disease. It's not a disease that we can classify anymore into mild, moderate, or severe. Uh, preeclampsia is severe, and we should treat it as such. Uh, we can differentiate between the, the features that they have as being uh, severe or mild, but we should consider it a severe disease. Uh, just before we continue, I thought I would just put in a, um, a social slide just to keep it light. Um, so I catered for the, the dog owners, uh, people that do have dogs. Um, it's not easy raising a puppy. It doesn't matter what you do, how you train them. Uh, they do um, cause chaos, but if you catch them, it's, it's, they don't really, it's not their fault. So, <laughs> Okay, so let's just talk about the, the pathophysiology. I thought this was a nice cartoon just to give us a nice idea. Generally, I think most of us will... will, will will understand the basic pathophysiology. But the uh, maternal syndrome of preeclampsia that we have on this side uh, is what we see clinically, but those women have problems way before that, starting off with the uh, poor, uh, poor placentation, where you have the effective artery remodeling. That leads to hypoxia or hyperperfusion of the, of the uh, placenta. Release of then anti-angiogenic factors into the systemic circulation, which leads to endothelial dysfunction. And that leads to then all of the complications that we see in preeclampsia. So let's just go a little bit into more detail into each one of those. If we look at the, the, the placentation, in a normal pregnancy, uh, the uteropresental arteries are formed when the trophoblast invades into the maternal um, arteries. It's uh, believed to happen in two stages. In the first trimester, we have uh, invasion into the decidual part, um, and in the second trimester, into the mitral part. And the consequence of this invasion, if it, if it happens, um, I don't want to say properly, but if it happens uh, how it's supposed to do, we have a low resistance, low pressure, but a high flow system in the placenta that can support the, uh, the fetal placental unit with everything that it needs up, um, in terms of oxygen and nutrients. Contrast to this, in preeclampsia, uh, remodeling only happens mostly in the, in the decidual layer, where your mitral areas are still, um, still have their muscular lining and they're responsive to hormones to cause vasoconstriction. So you don't have that nice flow. You have got a high resistance, high pressure with low flow system, which then fails to meet uh, the oxygen and nutrient demands and then leads to vasoconstriction and increased resistance. Just to illustrate this, if you look at the right, left-hand side, you can see that the trophoblasts are invading into that mitral area, um, and you've got a nice uh, large flow area coming into the intervillous space where in your preeclamptic lady with abnormal presentation, is still a large part that is not invaded and um, leads to vasoconstriction in those arteries. The vasoactive factors that are involved, the good ones, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor and placental growth factor. They both have mitogenic and also angiogenic um, properties and they are important for good placentation, good uh, vascular growth in the placenta and also ultimately good endothelial function. In normal pregnancy, uh, these factors increases to around about 32 weeks uh, where it peaks and then slightly uh, goes down towards the end of the pregnancy. Just to say something else about these factors, they exert the effect on the endothelium when they bind on um, FLT1 receptors, which stands for FMS-like tyrosine 1, FMS-like tyrosine kinase 1 um, receptors, and that's how they exert the effect and causes the vasodilatation. Uh, so 
The bad ones here is the soluble flit one and soluble endoglin, which are antagonistic to vascular endothelial growth factor and placental growth factor. So they are anti-angiogenic. They do, uh, we see them in all pregnancies, but they're low and they increase later in pregnancy. Just an illustration again. I see it's a little bit small now, but the yellow ones and the green ones and the top picture is a normal placenta. And you can see that they bind to the flit receptors and that's, that's the, how it's supposed to be. But then you've got the triangle S flit one in the bottom picture and they bind to these um, VEGF and PG, PLGF and so they cannot bind to their real receptors uh, and that leads to endothelial dysfunction. They did studies in rats where they injected S-flit into these rats and that actually produced hypertension, proteinuria, and also glomerular endotheliosis, what we see in mothers with, with preeclampsia. And the last important step in this uh, pathophysiology is the endothelium itself. The functions of the endothelium are four big functions. It serves as a physical barrier. It's important uh, modulator in vascular tone. It plays an important role in hemostasis and also in inflammation. Uh, this is essential for normal pregnancy because a normal pregnancy is characterized or can be summed up as a vasodilated, volume expanded, pro inflammatory, pro coagulant state. Um, whereas in preeclampsia, it's, it's almost the opposite or it's an exaggerated effect where you have a vasoconstricted, plasma contracted, exacerbated inflammatory response uh, with signs of intravascular clotting. And this then leads to multiple organ dysfunction that we pick up in preeclampsia. So what goes wrong in the endothelium when, you, when you, these factors are not uh, there to, to promote healthy endothelium? You have vasoconstriction, um, you've got increased vascular permeability, uh, which leads to uh, extra fluid leak into the extra vascular space. There's uh, increased expression of prothrombotic factors like from Willebrand factor, tissue factor, and uh, platelet activating factor, which leads to intravascular clotting. And then also there is increased, uh, cell, increased cell adhesion molecules, which leads to uh, increased secretion of interleukins and cytokines, and that just enhances the whole inflammatory response. Other thing that we need to say about um, uh, in terms of endothelial dysfunction, we have to talk about uh, um, thromboxane and also prostacyclin, the prostanoids. In normal pregnancy, they work in a balance. They both play a role in vasodilatation and, vaso and uh, platelet activation. In preeclampsia, we see an increase in the thromboxane and a decrease in the prostacyclin, which then leads to platelet activation and also vasoconstriction. Okay, so if we, if we look at strategies to, to treat... Um, Keeping this in mind, there's two ways that we can approach. We can look at preventing ladies that are at high risk, and also, if we don't prevent that, we can treat ladies that have already developed uh, um, preeclampsia. In order to prevent preeclampsia, we must um, try and predict which ladies are at high risk for preeclampsia. The NICE guidelines uh, identify these uh, high risk women by um, looking at maternal characteristics and also medical history. So they say that if you have any of hypertensive disease during a previous pregnancy, if there's chronic kidney disease, diabetes, autoimmune disease, chronic hypertension, that puts you at a high risk of, of, of developing preeclampsia. And um, they also include other factors which you need more of to qualify, including primiparity, age of more than 40, high BMI, and multiple pregnancy. Um, but there was other studies done. The uh, screening program for preeclampsia trial, the SPRE trial, uh, looked at other factors um, combined with the maternal factors uh, at a screening in 11 to 14 weeks, where, which showed that they were far superior to detecting ladies that eventually uh, developed preeclampsia later in that pregnancy. And the things they looked at, um, in addition to the maternal factors, are the uterine artery Doppler's um, pulsatility index, the mean arterial pressure, and then zero markers, uh, PAP A and placental growth factor. So this really increased the, the, the detection rate in preeclampsia, which is not really uh, possible in every um, country or not in our setting, but this is something that we, that we can consider in the future. 
So prevention strategies, the one that we have good evidence on that we, that we can use aspirin, or actually I should, low, should, should say that low-dose aspirin. Uh, if we look at how aspirin works, we know that it works on the, the, um, the COX-1 pathway and it prevents inflammation and pros uh, prostaglandin um, formation. But if you look at what low-dose aspirin only uh, mostly uh, inhibits the COX-1 in the platelets and not in the endothelial cells, so it subsequently reduces the platelet uh, thromboxane production, which leads to um, less platelet, platelet aggravation and vasoconstriction. So that's the basis how our aspirin, aspirin works. Uh, the trial that, um, the aspirin trial was done uh, where they screened uh, about 26,000 women uh, according to the, the, the model that I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, and then they randomized two groups and gave, gave the one group um, aspirin and the other group uh, placebo and uh, it showed a decrease of incidence in preterm preeclampsia. That's less than 37 weeks or 4.3% to 1.6%. Uh, but there is no impact on, on, on term preeclampsia. Uh, and the other, the other outcomes there were there was no difference in the maternal and also the neonatal, neonatal outcome. So the ISSHP recommends that uh, women who do have high risk, um, and they also talk about the maternal factors um, and the maternal factors in medical history, should be started on aspirin 150 milligrams at night, because the aspirin trial looked actually that night made a difference compared to day, uh, from as before 16 weeks, but that it can still have an influence up to 20 weeks of gestation. So in our setting, this would be ladies with previous preeclampsia, hypertension, diabetes, renal disease, antiphospholipid syndrome. <clears throat> calcium. Um, we know that calcium lowers blood pressure. That has been shown. How it works, we're not exactly sure. Uh, but the theory is that it alters, it's got to do with the renin, plasma renin levels, and also parathyroid levels. Whereas ladies who have a deficiency in calcium, um, this would lead to, to hypertension. Um, the ISSHP recommends that we give at least 1.2 to 2.5 gram supplementation in communities that have a low calcium intake in which we, of, of which we are one. Uh, and this will reduce the likelihood of, of preeclampsia. So those are the two big things that we can look at prevention. If we, some other things, uh, exercise is important. Uh, it is associated with reduced weight gain and also reduced hypertension in preeclampsia. And we're talking about 50 minutes, um, three times a week exercise is uh, necessary to, to have that effect. Things that does not work that has been looked at, um, low molecular weight heparin or infraction heparin does not decrease preeclampsia, vitamin C and E, fish oils, salt restriction. There are some more other things I didn't want to name many, but these things do not make a difference in, in, in preventing preeclampsia. <laughs> so there was another dog that uh, yeah, jumped into the house and ate up all the pillows, obviously. But we, in the end, we always forgive. Okay, treatment. Uh, once ladies have preeclampsia, what is our aims? We aim to prevent complications. And we also aim to prolong the pregnancy to decrease um, neonatal mobility and mortality that's associated with preterm prematurity. So our two drugs that we know, that we use and know work, and it's important, uh, but they mostly are important in preventing the complications. I'm just gonna say something about them. We use them every day, but antihypertensive drugs, uh, we need to manage uh, severe hypertension. Um, because we are uh, scared that patients may develop uh, stroke with a severe hypertension. And uh, how it works is in the cerebral blood flow is auto-regulated. When you look at the blue line is the um, cerebral perfusion pressure. Uh, between those values, the brain auto-regulates, but when it goes above 150, which comes down to about 180 systolic blood pressure, uh, depends, what, depends on your patient factors. So if your systolic goes above 170, 180, that you have a loss of autoregulation uh, within risk of, of uh, hemorrhage and, and infarct. Yeah, that is just what I said. If we look at blood pressure control and how to control it, the TRIPS, TRIPS trial um, 
uh, was a trial where they looked, compared ladies tight control of blood pressure where they aimed at a diastolic of 85, compared with ladies less tight uh, with a diastolic blood pressure of 100, um, which uh, the primary outcome was pregnancy loss uh, and, and, and NICU admission when the secondary outcome was severe, severe maternal uh, complications. The, tight, the difference we see here is that in the group that had tight control, there was um, a reduced likelihood of developing severe hypertension and then the, the admission and all the other risks that go with that. Uh, but that there was no difference in the primary outcome. <clears throat> so what, what the, the ISSHP recommends is that, and what we're actually doing, we, we urgently treat severe hypertension above 160 over 110, uh, and that we should target um, a blood pressure overall of 110 to 140 systolic over uh, 85 diastolic. Magnesium sulfate. Uh, the other drug that we use, uh, the last trial was done was, was the MAGPI trial. Um, and they looked at women who had preeclampsia and whether there was a question if we should use uh, preeclampsia and uh, um, MAGSOLF or not. Um, <clears throat> in the group that they gave MAGSOLF, it chose to have reduced the risk by half of developing eclampsia with no additional risk to the mother and also the fetus. How magnesium works in preventing this also we're not really sure. Uh, there's a couple of mechanisms that it can work. Um, it works on the calcium, opposing calcium dependent um, vasospasm in the, in, the, in the blood vessels and also decreases the threshold in your motor neurons and decreases acetylchylene, acetyl ACH uptake in the motor neuron implant. So those are the theories that, um, <laughs> that they describe. So recommended is that in um, low resource environments, all women should get, uh, all preeclamptic women should get um, max off. And when I was working in um, Bloemfontein, that's what happened. We gave every, every lady that delivered with preeclampsia got their five grams IMI for hourly for 24 hours after delivery. And somehow they managed to monitor those patients. But uh, um, they do say that in the other centers, th centers we can individualize um, and, and give ladies who have severe hypertension or uh, symptoms and signs of imidacloprid, so we can give them um, magnesium sulfate like in our, like in our setting. <clears throat> so those are the things that we know work and the things that we do use. If we look at the other things, it comes a bit more complicated. Um, this treatment is based on the biological mechanism of action, how it can possibly work, uh, at all the different uh, pathways. Um, the basic mechanism is we want to decrease ACEFLIT and also soluble endoglin, and we want to improve, improve endothelial function. I just wanted to keep this yeah, just as simple. Things that be a couple of things we're looking at and have looked at, proton pump inhibitors, uh, the way it works is that it decreases ESFLIT and also soluble endoglin release from the placenta and endothelium and subsequently decrease uh, endothelial dysfunction. We all know the PIE trial um, where they looked at so, 120 women given isomeprazole who had preeclampsia to see whether it can prolong preeclampsia, uh, but the conclusion was that um, it did not prolong the pregnancy. Statins, uh, something else that has been looked at biological mechanism is also, it induces the heme oxygenase pathway which subsequently decreases ESFLIT and soluble endoglin and that is an invasive predictive. Uh, there are studies that was done in, 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 in mice uh, that were given a pravastatin. Um, it actually showed that the uteroplacental blood flow did improve but there are trials underway that look at whether this in humans can actually uh, decrease ESFLIT and soluble endoglin, which we can then use to do further clinical trials to see whether it can prolong pregnancy. Sildenafil, we most know it as um, uh, Viagra. Uh, the mechanism is vasodilatation, which will improve uteroplacental flow. There is not much uh, that I could find here, but uh, there was a UK study done uh, which showed no prolongation of pregnancy uh, compared to uh, ladies who had placebo. 
However, a recent study that was done in Brazil showed that the Briggs you prolonged but with five days using sildenafil. So there's no, there's more, more studies needed to, to see whether we can actually use this. Then the last one I want to look at is one that we also have also been hearing about in, in the hospital, and that's metformin. And it works in a couple of ways. It inhibits um, the hypoxic inducible factor 1-alpha. It reduces uh, S-flit and soluble endoglin. It also reduces the cell adhesion molecules on the endothelial cells and vasodilatation. So there's a couple of ways that this can have an impact. And we know metformin is safe in pregnancy. There's been many studies done. We've got lots of diabetes, uh, diabetics who all use metformin. Um, in all of these studies, hypertension was secondary outcomes, and they did show that there was non-significant decrease in, in, in hypertension in preeclampsia. And we do have the PI2 trial that it's on the way, of which the primary outcome is uh, prolonging of pregnancy with ladies who have got early preeclampsia. The things that is is in the pipeline that, 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 that I read about, but obviously we don't really know about that. So I don't, don't want to go into too much detail, but apheresis, <clears throat> there was a pilot study, one that I could find in, in 11 women who had early um, preeclampsia. And it did show that um, um, ladies who had therapeutic apheresis to remove uh, S-flit-1 led to prolongation in the pregnancy of about eight days who were treated a single time. And if they were treated multiple times, it prolonged the pregnancy to 15 days compared to only three days in ladies who didn't receive any. And it also didn't report any major or, or fetal effects, but we do need more RCTs uh, in this area. And then the other thing is vascular endothelial growth uh, factor injections. Um, also, RATS comes to the fore here where uh, it suggests that um, placental growth factor injection uh, abolishes placental ischemia induced hypertension. And this is something potential that we can uh, think of in the future. So, I think the, the main points uh, that I took home or that I kept at home is um, we preeclampsia is a severe disease and we should, we, should, we should be treating every preeclampsia uh, as such. Uh, to tackle it, we have to identify high-risk women, which we do, but I think we do just need to be mindful of the fact that we should uh, focus on history and also factors that mothers have that, we can, uh, that can alert us to a mom who's at high risk for preeclampsia. In the ladies who are high-risk, we see if we can prevent them developing early preeclampsia by giving aspirin and low-dose aspirin and calcium. And in those who do develop Preclamps so we just uh, try and prevent the complications and that there are some possibilities for the future, but we do need more research. Thank you.